Thank you all, uh, all of the panelists and all of the attendees for joining us, taking time out of your Sunday um, to come and take part in the second day of the first annual West Coast Vascular and Interventional Symposium, clinically oriented VIR symp trainee symposium. Uh, and we really hope that you'll learn a lot from, uh, from the curriculum that we have planned today. Uh, international panel, private practice panel. Dr. V is going to talk about how to succeed as a um, as a medical student on VIR rotations, and of course, we're going to have we're going to be ending the day with a research panel. So our first uh, presenter, as a part of the international component, is Dr. Gregory Macris. We're really honored to have him. Um, he is a consultant in, in endovascular and interventional radiology at Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital in London. He's authored numerous publications on a wide variety of topics, ranging from VIR education to postpartum hemorrhage, and he's advocated for global VIR at TEDx. He's the past chairman of the Circe European Trainee Forum and the BSIR Training Committee. Dr. Greg, Dr. Macris, I'll invite you to uh, start taking it away. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's great, great work. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, I'm really happy to see more and more of these uh, um, uh, courses and, and these webinars taking place. I think it's very important to, um, you know, engage with a more junior uh, community of uh, future interventional radiologists. Um, and you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a bit about our European experience and the you know how the landscape is forming in Europe in terms of uh, interventional radiology training, and of course, I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, you know the collaboration that we uh, we have had with our international partners over the years. So the I mean I mean hopefully I mean probably most of you have been to Europe. Uh, at some point, I mean, it's uh, it's a very different environment to the U.S. I mean, it's uh, we have many different cultures, many different languages. There are there's a lot of history um, in, in in this continent, and uh, uh, both in a good way and a bad way, as you can imagine. And um, you know, there are a lot of politics, both within the country as well as when it comes to the dynamics between the various interventional communities in in, a, in every country. So. Having um, a unified approach when it comes to interventional radiology training and interventional radiology curriculum and all this, it's uh, it, it can be hard and it has been uh, it has been a massive challenge over the over the last few years. Of course, the, the presence of CERSI, which is the European the, the European side of interventional radiology, has um, has helped things a lot and has brought you know many of these countries together in a way uh, in order to um, Im improve training and um, you know the standards of the providing interventional radiology service in uh, in Europe however the above limitations still exist to some to some extent and um, it's uh, we, we have done quite a lot of work to try try to understand how this heterogeneity affects training affect recruitment and affects uh, at the end of the day the the future of uh, interventional radiology in, uh, in in Europe and and the UK I mean as you might have heard the UK since the beginning of 2021 doesn't belong to Europe anymore, but anyway, the, let's say details. Um, so, and I mean, the reason why we think that having a homogenous training across the board with, with I think why we think is important is because mostly because of the experience that you have guys in the US and because we have seen how successful it is to have a, an independent homogenous specialty training program across uh, across the continent and um, the reason why it's it's so difficult for us to follow your example to follow the US example is because of the of the reasons that I mentioned above because of the different languages the different uh, the different cultures and uh, we are confident that at some point we'll get there, but we need to. It's going to take a lot of work. But we, you know, we're learning from from your experience, and we're learning. We we can see how positive your experience is, and I'm sure we're going to talk a bit more about that in the um, uh, as we go on. And we hope to to get there at some point. And having the, the European Trainee Forum is basically like your um, uh, uh, RFS committees, our uh, trainee committee uh, under the auspices of Cersei. Uh, it was established uh, almost six years ago, 
and uh, we have um, a couple of representatives from from every country and it's a very nice group very nice dynamic group of young people who have a common passion on um, developing intervention rheology and we have done quite a lot of work over the last few years and uh, we're very proud that we have contributed in uh, having a, a unified curriculum for intervention rheology across europe obviously this curriculum is not mandatory for each country to adopt but uh, most national IR societies, uh, they have adopted this curriculum in one way or another. We also uh, helped to develop the an IR curriculum for medical students. I mean, obviously all these curriculums are free to download. You can always go to the search website and download them and see what we're talking about. Uh, especially for those who are medical students and watch this um, this talk, this the medical this IR medical uh, student curriculum, I think it's, it's very good because it's not just a list of things that you need to know. It has a bit of information about procedures and indication all this. So it's, I, I recommend for, uh, downloading this at some point. And of course, another part, uh, and probably very important part of our work has been um, trying to to map all these differences and all the, the status of the interventional radiology training. So what we did is we did a survey. Uh, we started with a survey within Europe, within our members in the committee, trying to understand the, the, the variability of IR training within, a, within every country. And what we found out is that, um, as we're expecting, is that, you know, there's a lot of variation. And, for example, even when it comes to basic things like how many years you're going to train, you need to train to become an interventional rheologist. Do you need one year of fellowship? Do you need two years? I mean, for example, in the UK, it's three years of training. But as you can see, every country is different. Some years, some in some countries you need one year, in some countries you need three years. And obviously, there's something wrong with this. I mean, that shouldn't be the case. I mean, there there, there should be a certain number of procedures that you need to do in order to be um, eligible to say that you are an interventional rheologist and that you're safe to practice. And of course, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem trying to get all people to agree how many years of training you need to become an interventional rheologist, but at some point we'll have to reach that consensus. And of course, we, we saw heterogeneity in many other aspects of training, like the how, how many opportunities for clinical training um, trainees have, um, how, many, how, how many opportunities for endovascular training they have. And as you can see from these tables, again, every country is very different. There's, not, there's no specific amount of time that you really need to do um, in, uh, in every country for, to, be, to say that you are competent in your um, uh, in your clinical skills when it comes to IR or when you, the, the very few countries have a very specified curriculum when it comes to endovascular training opportunities. So, so again, uh, that's a problem. We, and the, the good thing from the, the main thing that came out from that report is that we have this down on, on paper now, and we have discussed this extensively with the executive committee. And, you know, very often you say, okay, I mean, we knew that problem existed. We knew that we kind of expected that, but it's different when you put that in a report and when you present that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this again and again, to, to try to raise awareness and make people understand and think about this. And, and then we, we took things a step further and we tried to do um, a more global survey of uh, interventional rheology training. We tried to reach out to as many um, um, international uh, interventional rheology communities as uh, we could. Um, the SIR and the RFS community were very helpful. They, uh, they helped us a lot too with this, uh, with this project. And um, I mean, I have to say that most of the participants were from the UK and the EU, and we only have like 11, 12% of people from, from the US. And um, of course, this doesn't mean anything. I think we still got some interesting uh, perspectives from the, from the US. And of course, we hope that in the next five years, we will be able to repeat this survey. We'll repeat this and, and see how things are going. And that's, that's, the main, that's the main point about this work. We, we, we hope that this is our baseline and then we can base future work on this and then we can compare and see if we are doing better or worse or, or you know. So th there were some very interesting findings from, from this study. And um, I mean, it, it's, it seems that uh, you're doing a very good job in the US to introducing juniors to IR before they come to radiology. Um, in, in UK, we're, we're doing okay, but we probably can do better. And in Europe, it showed that our survey showed that they, they, we need to do more work when it comes to an, an undergrad awareness of interventional reality. And, and as we know, it's, it's very important to attract the right sort of talent in the, 
in, in interventional radiology before before they are in radiology. Well, I think if they are already in radiology, it's, it, it might be a bit too late. We, we need to attract those surgical minded candidates to, to our specialty. And um, in order to do that, we need strong um, uh, uh, raise awareness programs in, 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 in the medical school and um, you know, try to support radiological societies in, in every medical school. And of course, that, all these things take time, but um, that's, that's why we're here. That's why the CERC ETF is here. That's why the RFS is here. And um, that's why we're joining forces to support um, initiatives like, like, for example, this one today. Um, and of course, when it comes to what inspires people, I mean, we, as, as expected, you know, the, the influence of more senior colleagues has been important in, in, in all countries. And, and of course, how much exposure they get during radiology training. And uh, that's why it's very important that IR train, uh, radiology trainees get early introduction to interventional radiology before they are distracted by exams and everything else that they need to do during their um, diagnostic training. And, you know, of course, as expected, most people seem to be quite happy with uh, the quality of life that they had and with the, you know, overall experience with IR training. Um, and, um, you know, the, the vast majority would recommend IR training to junior colleagues and, uh, and medical students, which is, again, is not a surprise. We know that interventional is a very attractive option and we know that it has many, um, it has to offer a lot. Uh, for the future uh, trainees. Um, another, uh, an interesting question that I always get from people who, from juniors who are interested in joining IR is about the competition. And um, I mean, competition is everywhere. And the competition is a good thing as well. It makes, it makes us better and uh, it helps us evolve. Of course, you know, there, there, there have been traditionally issues with surgical specialties trying to, in a way, um, Take, take things away from us. But, you know, in, in most occasions, I think that it's, it's uh, things work out and it's, a matter, it's, it's about collaborating, it's about being aggressive and it's about trying to improve your skills. And I think as long as we insist on uh, making sure that, you know, every interventional radiology trainee gets the proper vascular training that he needs, the proper interventional oncology training that they need, the proper urological training that they need, then when they come out, they can decide what they want to do best and they can they can go for it and they can compete in the free market. I think this that's that's how we should see it. As long as we get the proper training, we have we have nothing to worry about. And of course getting the proper training is about um you know, working uh, in collaboration with all the, you know, the, the colleges and the, for, for example, the Royal College and the societies to make sure that they protect our training rights. And, you know, the, of course, that's, that's our job. That's the job of the trainee committees and the, and the executive committees of our societies. But it's also important that you guys get involved in those societies and you support them because all these societies work out of our free time. And of course, you know, nobody has free time. I mean, we have to make some to support our specialty and support the future. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time with this. I know that we don't have much time. I mean, uh, overall, people are generally happy with the kind of training opportunities they get across the board. Maybe when it comes to endovascular procedures, the, there's a slight gap, there's a slight difference between the various countries. But again, as I said, it, it's all about us insisting that, um, you know, our IR curriculum is respected uh, in all its aspects and that people get the, the training that they need. Um, and of course, collaboration. I mean, uh, I've, I've been in the ATF um, for the last five years, uh, almost six years now. And, uh, you know, I had the pleasure of working with some great people of, um, in RFS. I met many great people in the RFS, in, uh, you know, the Paris Society, the, the Canadian Society, the South American Society. And, uh, you know, I, th I think one of the one of the best things about, about this is that, you know, is that you create a network. We all have the same agenda. We all understand what, what we need to do. And, you know, working together, we can, uh, we can achieve things that we could never achieve on, on individually. And uh, we're learning from each other as well. I mean, it's, it's amazing how many things I've learned from the, from the RFS committee, how many ideas I got from them. And, um, and, you know, we always try to invite them in our conferences and in our uh, board meetings, and they have always been doing the same for us. So I, I think it's, it's very important to, you know, continue this collaboration and, and this um, uh, 
um, and, and these initiatives because uh, they're they are very important for the for the future. And uh, you know, there are so many projects that we can do going forward. So, for example, this international survey, just a small example. This could have never been possible without this kind of of network. And this is, of course, just the beginning. I mean, there is there are so many opportunities, and I'm so glad to see that. For example, I have Indra with us today, who is one of our uh, um, junior doctors who has done a great work in the UK, and he has already started creating his own network with you know the RFS guys and you know other societies. So this is what we need to see. We need to see more of you guys interacting with each other and, and you know, creating um, future opportunities. And of course, what we need to see, I mean, this is what we're trying to do in Europe, is we need to see more um, trainee committees. And I know that in the US, you're doing very good at that. You have all your own local and state committees. Uh, I mean, in, in Europe, we try to create more national trainee committees because until last year, we didn't have, apart from the UK, we didn't have almost any other national training committee. So we try to create those uh, training committees at the local level as well, because I th we think it's very important to engage with as many young people in every country as we can. So uh, thank you very much. I mean, um, since I'm here, there, it seems like there's a lot of appetite for webinars. So CERC has many uh, free webinars for trainees. Uh, just follow that. If you go to CERC uh, uh, website at the ETF section, you can find this is a great schedule of uh, nice talks that are coming. Next one is in 25th of February. They're all free. And uh, hopefully see you in Lisbon, September. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Macris. That was a really valuable presentation. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speakers uh, for this session, Dr. Fabian Laguap and Dr. Eric Buguji. He is the, uh, Fabian is the chief resident in interventional radiology at Yale New Haven. He's the co-founder of Road to IR, which is a collaborative effort between uh, the MUHAS in Tanzania, and it has the goal of making VIR accessible in Africa. Eric is a VIR fellow at the MUHAS in Tanzania. He's interested in research, especially uterine fibroid embolization, and he's coordinated the steps of the initiation of the first VIR service and the first accredited IR training in Sub-Saharan Africa. He represents Tanzania in the Society of African Interventional Radiology and Endovascular Therapy. So uh, I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you. Can you see my slides? Yes. All right, great. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, so I can already see that we're at risk of uh, running over time for this session, so I'll try to uh, be quick. Um, <clears throat> just want to sort of give some, you know, give you guys an idea of what the status of intervention radiology is in other parts of the world. I mean, you've heard a lot about all the amazing stuff can uh, intervention radio radiology can do over the past two days. But unfortunately, about half of the global population actually doesn't have any access to interventional radiology. So all of these amazing things that you've heard about, a lot of patients do not have access to. And this is most severe in Sub-Saharan Africa. So there you have about 1.1 billion people, more than 90% of which do not have access to any of these treatments, not even like an abscess drainage or nephrostomy, which is absolutely insane. So in all of Sub-Saharan Africa, you've lent less than 20 intervention radiologists outside of South Africa. So basically all of this, you have less than 20 intervention radiologists. In order to match the numbers that we have in the US, you would need, you would need 10,000 intervention radiologists here, okay? And the problem is that there are no IR training programs in South Africa. So I'm gonna to talk today with Eric uh, about Tanzania, which is located over here in East Africa but it's really just representative for all of Sub-Saharan Africa. So what we're talking about today applies to pretty much every other country in Sub-Saharan Africa. So Tanzania has a population of about 60 million people and is expected to grow to 100 million by 2040. And when I first went to Tanzania in 2017, and there wasn't a single interventional radiologist in Tanzania, but they had access to all of the imaging equipment that you need for IR. And there was already a large diagnostic radiology uh, training program in place. Uh, including Eric here, who was a second year radiology resident at the time when we first met. So and, uh, I was a second year uh, resident at Yale when I went over there. So uh, based on the, on the extreme need for IR in Tanzania and, and surrounding countries, we came up with a plan how we can get IR started there. 
So we said we have to focus on three same things. There's the training of residents, training of nurses and technologists, and improving some of the already existing facilities and, and equipment. Most importantly, getting some disposable equipment there. And since there wasn't any interventory or just in Tanzania, we had to bring the expertise to Tanzania. And we said we, we're going to do that by sending a team there every month. And so that's basically what we did. So uh, every month, the team goes there for two weeks. We started back in October 2018 and managed to pretty much send a team there every month after until COVID started. So you can see in every team basically has an attending, a tech, a nurse, and usually like a trainee and or a medical student. And we did this successfully until February of 2020. So then, of course, COVID started. So, you know, we're sort of on a long break due to travel restrictions, et cetera. But we've now resumed our trips um, this past December. Um, so uh, Dr. Takura from Florida went, followed by uh, Dr. Sandika from South Africa, who's the president of the South African IR Society. Um, and right now, Dr. Ian Wilson from Rochester is, is in Tanzania. Um, and we hope that we can, get, uh, you know, keep things going despite COVID because, you know, as we all know, new normal and, you know, we just have to adapt to things. You know, is there residual risk with travel during COVID? Yes. But, you know, is there really an alternative? No. So we figured we're just going to keep going. And um, here's just a couple of pictures from when we first got started. So this is actually from the very first trip uh, when we went to Tanzania with Dr. Sillen from, from Yale, bringing our own equipment. And this is a picture from the very first um, procedure we did. And we sent about uh, 60 people to Tanzania. And this was really coordination, a lot of teamwork. So a lot of the things that Greg was talking about, you know, building a network, all of that uh, is extremely important. Um, so Eric, who's the chief of yeah, as you heard, and he's going to give us a little uh, impression of, you know, what, what they've been doing there over the past uh, uh, two, three years. Go ahead, Eric. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you yes. hear me? Yeah. Thank you very much, Fabian, for the introduction. Uh, as you know, that since the intervention of the only service was not uh, present in our country, so we started with the immediate needs. As you know, patients we are there, diseases we are there, and uh, so... Uh, the first one, which was in 2018, we started with immediate need, like you know, in Tanzania, we had a lot of uh, patients like any bulbs which was needed, it was like to do like a fine needle, or if the fine needle has not yielded really good enough results, so patients were undergoing open bulbs. So we started doing like a core needle bulbs, which was like an emergency and immediate needs. As you can just see the pictures over there, that I'm doing like a core needle, you can see my uh, my fellow Dr. Azar taking some bouts under under ultrasound. Next, next. You can see we, as we know, in Tanzania and the some of sub 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 Saharan African countries, uh, we have a, a high disease burden of, of cervical cancer, and the most of the women present with obstructive uropathy. And you know, before our services, those patients were dying because they cannot continue. Uh, chemotherapy because of high creatinine and stuff like that. So after initiation of the endophrostomy, uh, you can see how much and uh, how uh, how much we've saved the life of uh, uh, Tanzanian women. From the pictures, you can see our first nephrostomy uh, from, uh, supervised by Dr. Nima Kokabi from Emory. Next. Uh, you can see bigger advantage. In Tanzania, we have a lot of cholangiocarcinoma, HCC, those patients, ideally before our services, patients were dying, sending home, like oh, most of them were dying under local beliefs and local culture because there was no other things to be done. You can see people are like climbing, uh, yeah. enjoying doing our first BDR case. And all those are the, uh, we can see in the images, those are, are local fellows and the local techs. And after we have done a couple of immediate uh, needs, uh, so we tried now to go further and we started to do like uh, core procedures. You know, uh, in Tanzania, we have a large increased number of uh, uh, people with uh, end stage dialysis, end stage renal disease, and large number of people having like dialysis. But the supplying thing is that they are doing dialysis, they were doing dialysis under temporary catheters. So you can find someone that has a temporary catheter almost for four years. So there are a lot of complications. Uh, but 
after starting our service, we, have, we are now offering a turn in the Casseta. You can see from the pictures, you can see. And uh, we improved and going more to complex cases. Now we can do like a spend cambo. And uh, you know, uterine fibroid embolization is like a most common uh, uh, present, uh, disease. Uh, uterine fibroid is the most common disease in uh, black Africans or, or black Americans and Africans. So. There's a huge demand of youth and fiber embolization in Tanzania, but most of them are just treated by mammectomy, which has high impact on mobility and mortality, but also the cost of it is very much high in Tanzania, apart from its safety. So slowly, progressively, we went into phase two to do like more complex procedures. Next. So you can see uh, the visiting team last year, we did like a first ever conventional test in Tanzania, uh, but more, more interesting was like a first trans radio case, which everybody was like, oh, what is this thing happening? And you can see picture after the procedure, people are like, we are masculine now, we can go more, more and the limit is the sky. Next, please. So we will have a lot of diseases, peripheral arterial diseases. Uh, this picture are just coming from this visit. So we did like a uh, peripheral vascular procedure and, uh, uh, and, uh, and our visiting attendings. But you can see we were doing some of our procedures from, from this, just a simple CM. But you, within our compound, we have like three institutes. So you can see a bland, a new hybrid double a biplane. Uh, cat lab which is nearby the institute within our compounds whereby we are like now doing like a collaboration so we are given access to use uh, that facility and you can see people like doing complex procedures in that cat lab you can see people are very excited because that's that institute is more on uh, orthopedic and neuro so they were they asked us if we can help we can offer a diagnostic angiogram uh, for vessel angio and uh, and uh, you can see there it's like written in Swahili but in English means like this is a new era a new page in, in Tanzania next so we we have done a lot so in, and uh, so far we have more of none of our, more of than 500 uh, procedures uh, non-vascular cases, which is like called about leading forward by uh, genitourinary systems. And uh, as I've said, we are being now improving to vascular procedures. UFE is the most leading forward by the time catheter. Slowly, we are going to do more, more, more uh, cases. Next, please. Uh, you can see most of our patients are coming from surgery, followed by obstetric and gynecology. However, Tanzania is a big country, almost the biggest country in East Africa. So people, you can see some people are traveling over 24 hours. And over 24 hours, are like a thousand, more than a thousand uh, kilometers just to seek for intervention at your service. And, but despite that, most of them are uh, traveling like uh, zero to three hours to get services. So right. most Thanks, welcome Eric. Fabian to finish up. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, so here's just a little throwback to pre-COVID times. So we've been very fortunate to go to a lot of meetings, um, you know, hanging out with Dr. V, Greg, many other people that are on the call here. And, um, you know, you guys are probably too young to remember, but uh, there was a time when you could actually go to in-person meetings, uh, which was a beautiful thing. And I, I hope uh, we can return to that eventually. Uh, you can find more um, about this program in a JVIR application from a couple of years ago. And uh, we're right now in the process of submitting a follow-up paper with uh, more data of our uh, experience so far. So in conclusion, um, in Tanzania, we went from assessment to graduation of the first classes, which is going to be this September in about four years. And I think that this can really be used as a bl blueprint for many other uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Because, you know, as I said in the beginning, uh, you know, this problem is not unique to Tanzania. Okay, there's at least 20, 30 other countries um, that have exactly the same problems. But in order to do this, we need to work closely together and uh, international collaboration, like Greg said, is really the key. Okay, a lot of the problems that exist in in, um, in Europe in terms of, um, you know, collaboration across countries, of course, also exist in Africa. And we can only really get this done if we work uh, closely together. And um, I want to thank who's funding our project, uh, Sapphire and all the, the institutions that are involved. 
And you can find more info on our website, which is road to All right. Definitely check out roadtoir.org. Um, it's an incredible program. Learn so much. Uh, it's some incredible work you guys um, are all doing. Um, so next, I would like to introduce Dr. Gaurav Gangwani. He's a consultant interventional radiologist in Maharashtra, India. He's active in the ISVIR, the Indian Society of Interventional Radiology, and he performs interventions from head to toe with a special interest in hepatobiliary and uh, interventional oncology. All right, I'll let you get started. Thank you, Dr. Bullock, for that introduction. Uh, after the talks of, I hope I'm audible. After the talks of Dr. Macris and uh, Dr. Fabi and Dr. Guje, I have been very inspired. The phenomenal work, Dr. Fabian, what you're doing in Tanzania and Africa. So uh, I've been interested by these uh, two small topics. Uh, one is the role of ISVIR society in Indian IR, VIR, and uh, opportunities to grow IR globally. So let's just shoot. Uh, so yes. Uh, so I'll start with ISVIR, the journey so far, where we were and where we are. Yeah, so it is the Indian Society of Vascular and Interventional Radiology. I just went through the history uh, to understand how ISVIR framed and played a role in the society, uh, in the growth of VIR across India. And uh, I found that before following the suit of uh, Charles' daughter and uh, the interventions worldwide when they started, 1970s was the time when VIR started in India. And But even across two decades, it had grown just by a dozen of procedures and in four institutions. So almost early 90s, all we could see was specialized IR, few services in a three to four institutions. And after that, if we see the graph, it suddenly shot up. So I was wondering what actually changed in that particular year, late 90s, that led to this. And I found that it was the formation of this collaborative society by all the interventional radiologists of India, ISVIR. Uh, it was formally formed finally on November 7th, 1997 with 28 founder members uh, across multiple institutions. And uh, from then, since uh, the society became a more organized structure, uh, the role of IR shot up in the country in terms of volumes, in terms of performance. Uh, we can check the, so we now have almost 840 active members and counting, and of course, a lot more trainees and fellows taking interest. So uh, the statistics gets updated live in our website. So how did ISVIR play this role and how uh, did it impact and change the game from late 90s to where we are now? So uh, one was by education. So we have our annual national conferences that started right from its inception. And in this, uh, we just completed the 21st on annual conference in 2019, 2020, we had to cancel, but we did keep a virtual midterm CME uh, complication meet, which is there. And besides the uh, annual national conferences, each state or zonal chapter has their own set of conferences, either monthly meetings or quarterly large conferences. So we are trying to keep the education going on so that all of us are share our skill sets. Even the pandemic did not really stop ISVIR. We continued the platform through Zoom, uh, the education system, and uh, all the uh, knowledge-based videos are there on our YouTube platform, so they can be accessed. Uh, but yes, uh, academics and education is not complete unless you trend into research. And for that, the venture which started off as newsletters for almost two decades, uh, got converted into an official journal from the ISVR Society, which launched in 2017, the Journal of Clinical Interventional Radiology, which is now an open access indexed journal and one of the two intervention journals from India, which is uh, indexed. Uh, we are very thankful to our editor-in-chief, Dr. Sham Kumar Kesha, for pioneer in this field, and Dr. Sanjeeva Kalwa, our international editor. Again, lots of gratitude to him for this initiative. Uh, this slide of our volume one, the extraversion is a very peculiar shape and somehow matches the day to day. So uh, as far as training is concerned, after education research, it's, it does not expand unless you pass it on. So this is the 
official web page of uh, ISVR website and if we see the fellowship programs we almost have from down uh, up north to down south west we almost have about 39 centers as of now which offer either one year fellowships or certificate courses or even dm three year dm courses and it's expanding uh, the mci the medical council of india has recognized ir as a distinct subspecialty now and official three year dm courses are being launched this year across multiple institutions so but yes the training should also be global it's very important to collaborate like uh, our previous speakers have entitled and uh, that is a huge key to bring in and all the skill sets and exchange them uh, like dr uh, Georgie mentioned in his uh, chat that cross pollination of the skill sets is very important. So, global we are working towards uh, collaborating with various societies, and uh, we can see that in their national conferences, there is a ISVIR chapter uh, division in every one of those conferences. We have travel fellowships and exchange programs for uh, exchanging uh, the ideas and the skill sets so the work in that regard is going on of course there's no end to refinement and improvement but it's going on yes we uh, the society has started getting active on social media it's still in its budding stages now but we have an official twitter facebook handle youtube handle and uh, things are going more organized uh, we are one of the societies who have their own uh, national based uh, ir registry where we are recording uh, most of our vascular and uh, vascular interventional procedures since 1999 a uh, few centers started this but now more and more centers are getting enrolled and they are uh, digitally archiving their cases at least the registry so uh, whatever record we have official from 5000 cases in 1999 we can we saw one lakh cases in 2018 which is a huge growth and this is not complete this is just the official documented registry uh, soon when we have the data it's going to expand uh, one of the challenges in India is the uh, hardware, um, government policies, hardware. It takes some time when a product gets launched to reach India. But uh, right now the society, because it's a structured uh, approach now, so we are in terms of collaboration with the industry partners also, and we are working to make it more smooth and get products launched globally at almost the same time and increase. So this was about the role of ISVR in India. Uh, the next topic is a little more broad. Uh, interested to me was opportunities to challenge, to change uh, vascular and interventional radiology globally. Uh, when I went through the list of uh, the panelists uh, in this West Coast Symposium, and I was really, to be honest, intimidated by this topic because uh, I thought it's a very broad topic and there are many more people who can share their insights and give much more than what I can share. But since this is a topic assigned by the organizers, I'll just share my part. So when you think of changing something, I just was reviewing the life of few CEOs and people who have really brought about a huge revolution in terms of change in their industries. And I really uh, got very inspired by the life of these three individuals. And uh, when I was looking at their USPs, what they did to bring about that change, I found that uh, these were the three principles on which or based on which they brought those changes. Steve Jobs brought something very unique, very different, a brand. Uh, once somebody gets hooked on to it, it was difficult to go back to the traditional uh, smartphones or the windows. Jeff Bezos, one of the uh, fastest growing industrialist uh, entrepreneur, uh, his venture is completely customer friendly. He could understand the DNA of the customers and what they want. And finally, uh, Elon Musk, man, everyone is talking about uh, revolutionary out of the world thinker. And I realized that uh, we do have the same things in VIR. Uh, we have skill sets that are very unique. In fact, uh, I just visit when I wanted to get cases that are unique, that are different. I just thought I'll go to the Twitter handle page of uh, my senior colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Chick, and I know every day I'll get unique cases there. So we have a lot of unique cases, sharp recanalizations of long segments to uh, plug and go, uh, sinoacrylate embolizations of ureters. Uh, then I visited the web uh, Twitter handle of Dr. Keith Paran and I found how they are doing trophies along with superior hypogastric plexus block and they are uh, bringing down the discharge time or even for a daycare procedure to as low as three hours post procedure, which is phenomenal for someone who is uh, someone of my colleague in India. And then, uh, of course, revolutionary out-of-the-box IR ideas 
each week i hear of new procedures like the cholangoscopic lithotripsies and multi level kyphoplasties to bring about palliative care and uh, so we do have content of course cross pollination is very important these uh, op options these assets may be there in particular institutions with particular virs but if we uh, help cross pollinate of course all of us we may learn it but uh, my the way i think vir can actually change globally is not just to have these usps and these contents but to actually market it it's very important that we reach the people and they are aware of these procedures we have lived very long being a referral based practice and a referral based subspecialty uh, i think all of us understand that it is the need of the r to get our own uh, acknowledgement now so as a difference of specialty a patient should come to a hospital and ask for a vir opd consult so we have all our usps we just need to approach it as far as turf invasions is concerned i feel that we all are uh, fighting over turf wars which is not that important because uh, we are fighting over 1% of cases that are there for that indication whereas there is a lot more population which are not even getting these services we just saw tanzania how people don't have access to a basic drainage a basic nephrostomy so similarly if i see a cli patient 99% of these patients are not even getting an option offered for angioplasty before an amputation so if all these cases translate to the endovascular referrals then there may be even all combined irs and vascular surgeons may be very less in number to solve them and same thing we just change the indication and same thing goes on ufe we have if we can save so many hysterectomies if we offer this option of ufe we can save turps and for few indications like stroke there's no medical special sub specialist who is winning it's time uh, most of these patients 70% of these patients according to who end up with disability or death and then they don't reach the hospital in time so i feel if we just create awareness we might have so much work on our hands that all of these different turfs offering endovascular work can uh, offer their services and still they'll fall short in terms of numbers so uh, rather than competing with each other we should collaborate share our roles define our roles and so instead of turf invasion it should be turf sharing and uh, i feel that that would be in the long way good of course by saying all this that we have content and we just need to market it i don't mean we don't need to ex uh, evolve and don't need to expand our content it is very important that we keep evolving along with other specialties otherwise just keep being the same we may be evolving but maybe not at the rate at which we should so our partner clinical specialties are evolving fast especially the world of oncology so we need that do need to encompass all of that into ir research and expand so that was my take on these topics uh, role of isvir and how i feel my insights on how i feel we can change globally the uh, vir community thank you uh, special thanks to the west coast organizers thank you dr anavdi for this opportunity thank you very much dr gangwani that was a really valuable presentation i really appreciate the taking you taking the time uh, out of your sunday to to help uh, teach us a little bit more uh, about the isvir and training in india um, for the next talk i'm going to introduce indrajit mandel he's a f2 senior house officer at the royal berkshire hospital in reading uh, united kingdom he founded IR Juniors and serves as the as a representative on the BSIR training committee. Uh, so I'll go ahead and invite you to uh, take it away. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me on the panel. Um, we haven't got very long, so I'm going to try and be as quick as possible and hopefully at least have time for a, a couple of questions or something. Um, so thanks for the introduction, Navji. <coughs> Uh, so a little bit about the UK. So it's about 67 million people, so about a fifth of the size of the UK. Um, and the health system is a national system paid for by the government. And each area has kind of a network that looks after the, the health needs of that population. In terms of how many IRs there are, there's currently about 666. And so that matches, it's about a fifth of what is it in the US. Um, so in terms of the you know patient IR ratio, it's pretty similar to uh, what you've got in the in the US. I thought I'd just briefly touch on the training structure, um, and I put a, a graph here or a graphic here comparing the US and the UK. So currently, IR is a subspecialty; um, it's not its separate one. 
and it offers a two plus three plus three model. So that's a two year internship, three year diagnostics and three years interventional. And in terms of academic options, those are easily available too. Um, and so at different levels in your training pathway, you can offer protected time for research if you want to get involved in that side of things. In terms of the exams, they, uh, there's a diagnostic radiology exam, which is the Royal College of Radiologists exams. There's no specific IR exam, but many choose to take the European exams. And then fellowships are often done abroad. So um, this panel on global IR is quite important. And many current IR consultants in the UK have gone to Australia and Canada and have already kind of got involved in, uh, you know, getting involved globally. So generally, um, comparing to the US, the postgraduate training is longer, uh, although our medical school starts earlier, so it kind of balances out in the end. There's a little bit more IR time, so three years in total dedicated IR compared to two years in the US. The work hours are a little bit less, which is, which is always nice. Um, and it's also a good opportunity for flexible careers. So if you wanted to take time for research or training abroad, or if you wanted a career break, all of those things are easily possible within the training program. Also in terms in the US, there's more direct entry into radiology. So in the UK, there's two years of equivalent of internship training. Um, that's only one year in the US. And so in terms of the certainty of getting into the training program, um, it's often as a junior doctor, people will choose between surgery or radiology. And so that's a good time to kind of capture interest in IR. And this is kind of some of our audience for uh, the IR juniors, which I'll talk about in a second. The clinical model is already in place in the US. And I think the future directions for the UK are that it's gonna head to that uh, model. So in 2019 at the BSIR meeting, there was a vote for IR to become its own specialty. And so these discussions are underway under, at the Royal College. And it's likely that in the next year or two, direct IR entry will be a, a reality. And so applicants can choose a preference to do IR and they'll be selected by interventional radiologists at the time of residency starting. And the clinical training is going to be increased, but we're still in the process of deciding how long that will be. For example, say doing a vascular surgery rotation or ICU rotation, you know, the length of time is still up for debate. I thought I'd briefly touch on IR juniors because that's kind of the main thing we've done to engage medical students and junior doctors. Uh, so it was set up last year. Um, uh, basically, it initially started as a couple of web pages. Um, actually, I, I went to Dr. Macris with the idea on a random afternoon and he loved it and con convinced me to actually make it a real website and got in touch with a few of our co-founders and we managed to create a a whole website and a movement based on it. Um, it's a shame that COVID kind of ruined some of the on in-person events. So we're hoping that that can uh, recur in the future. So we've shifted to webinars and they've been quite successful in engaging medical students and junior doctors. Arguably even better because, you know, the medical students weren't limited by geographics or they could, if they didn't have IR in their institution, they could just join the webinars and that way they would be able to get involved in the specialty. And it really shows that there is a, a need for a, a specific group engaging medical students. We've also attracted global interest. And so we're in talks to set up similar initiatives in Ireland and Australia. And that way their medical students can see what the wonderful specialty has to offer. In terms of next steps, so hopefully we've gonna have some events and a conference going ahead and provide support for medical students. Um, the main thing I wanted to mention is the uh, research collaborative. And so um, what we're trying to do is set up multi-center research projects to build the evidence base and collaborate across many institutions. And also our cross-specialty collaboration is something we're really kind of keen to promote because it's important that surgeons, oncologists, and lots of the other specialties know about IR because there'll be A, kind of referral bases and B, it will kind of get rid of some of the turf wars that have always been talked about in IR so that each specialty understands each other. And also international collaborations is something that we're also looking to do as IR juniors. 
So thank you for listening to my talk. Um, if you wanted to come to the UK or collaborate, very happy to do that. Um, here's our email and our Twitter handles, and hopefully I haven't taken too much time and we've got some time for questions. Thank you. So I think um, what we're going to try to do is, you know, all the attendees, feel free to ask questions in the chat section, um, and uh, the panelists will be able to answer them there. Um, just for the sake of time, uh, I think what we're going to do now uh, is we'll go ahead and start a little the private practice Q&A. Um, if you had expressed interest, uh, you have received a Zoom link. Uh, go ahead and click on that Zoom link, join that meeting, uh, and Dr. Devolapalli will, will be there as well. Um, and then in the meantime, on the main session, I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Zaim Billa, uh, currently an integrated VIR resident at uh, Kaiser LA, uh, introduce the next session. Thank you very much, Navjeet. And thank you to everyone for that previous talk. That was so inspirational to see everyone fighting the good fight, bringing VIR to every country around the world. Um, I love to see it. And so now I'd like to introduce one of my personal mentors who has been involved in guiding students, residents, and even attendings around the world on their journey to VIR. He's an attending vascular and interventional physician at KT Visla, passionate about bringing clinical VIR and patient care into the forefront of our industry. I'd like to introduce Dr. Joji Vatican Cherry to give a talk on how to approach VIR as a medical student. Thanks, everyone. Um, let me share my screen. Wow, what inspirational uh, conversations this morning. Um, really want to get back out there. I can't wait till uh, COVID is kind of swashed as so we can get back into the real world. And uh, really enjoyed working with Macris and Fabian, had some good times and some really good food um, in, in Spain. And, Whatnot. So let me uh, kind of show you my vision of how we need to change training, because what I realized is my training was inadequate to do what I do today. OK, and it was poor training, really, um, to be honest with you. So um, how do you approach it as a medical student? So you have to have a showcase to come into VIR. OK, and pre-COVID, it was how many busy VIR rotations you did. And what I'm seeing is a, a, a kind of divergence between DR training during that fourth year and VIR training during that fourth year. And by the time you start internship in a surgical internship, you're already fundamentally different. Um, now, with that, with the, the, if COVID still exists for next year for your fourth years that are coming up, you should do an interventional car, other vascular or endovascular procedural fields, interventional cardiology, neurointerventional. Certainly, even if, uh, if you do the IR rotation, still vascular surgery to understand kind of how to manage the kind of acute limit schemas and chronic limit schemas and do additional local VR blocks either with you or you're going to see a lot of people like Dr. Andrews and Dr. Constantino and Dr. Julian work with them, rotate with them as a med student, a lot to learn from them, okay? And then a surgical sub in ICU. I think those are invaluable rotations that you have to do as a fourth year. Um, one of the, my biggest regrets is not doing an ICU rotation as a fourth year medical student and it really hindered my progression as a physician. And surgical sub I is important so that you feel comfortable and can jump into that surgical engineering year. I've seen a lot of people go into that surgical engineering year without a good foundation fourth year and really struggle throughout the year. You don't want to do that. So these are lessons I've learned from talking to countless students. Um, being involved in SIR Med Student Council is also paramount. Um, step one and two, even though one is going away, still consolidate your basic sciences. Uh, what we do look at is internal medicine, general surgery, because a lot of what we do conveys through those two topics, okay? So again, I am a G surgery. Try to really do your best to honor those blocks. Um, these virtual VR meetings, it's very important that you get a foundation of understanding of the diseases and where we're going in society. We want to know that you know what you're getting yourself into in the virig, the vascular interventional radiology interest group, separate from the DR, develop your own virig and fight for your right to have that. And also collaborate with your surgery interest groups. They're very similar to what we do. So bring them in. Some of those surgical students who are actually will love VIR. And then, like I said, these fourth year rotations are very important. VIR, vascular surgery, INR, IC. And try to identify a good letter writer for VIR and surgery, sub I or surgery or vascular surgery. When you get into your way VIR, one of the things you want to be is first in, last out. Okay, it is a busy rotation, okay? Um, so you're going to come in before, you don't want to be there after the faculty and certainly before the, after the chief resident or the fellow, that's a bad, you know, bad sign. You're just setting a bad precedent and you got to stay there late. 
If not, this is probably not the right field for you. Okay. You're not going to be happy when you come out. Okay. You have to stay humble and hungry. This is a field. It, 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 it's very humbling. You know, every week or every other week, I'm like, man, I can't believe I did that or what a boneheaded move or, or that bad outcome. And you just really get depressed. So recognize that you better be humble because you, you know, it is a humbling field. Be a team player. If you're going to have to, you know, several other students, technologists, nurses, if you don't work collaboratively with them, you will fail. And people will recognize that. So have some emotional intelligence and situational awareness and introduce yourself to everyone. Get your gloves, ask to do stuff, see how you can be helpful, transport patients, whatever it takes. Write the clinic notes, consults, and procedure notes. That's where you're going to learn how to kind of navigate the equipment, what device you had. You'll move forward faster in your understanding of the rotation and use the way rotation guides that SIR has to offer. And you can email me if you have any questions about that. So we're changing from a technical specialty to a clinical specialty, and this transition is exceedingly challenging. It's hard enough in the US, but it's even harder in, the, in, in Europe and other places. Um, what happens I've seen is you take an MS1 who wants to be a surgical minded individual, and through those six years of DR training and even a purely procedural IR year, you lose that clinical acumen. You don't become a, cog a cognitive clinical specialist. You become a pure technician who has to take order entry. So we have to stop that cycle. That life cycle is de devastating. So I gave a talk at SIR in, in San Diego in 2009. And what I recognized was a group of radiology residents who were really hungry for clinical medicine, wanted to take care of patients, provide longitudinal care. And what was frustrating to them, they were surrounded by imaging residents who kind of poo-pooed what they were doing and said, oh, you guys are fools for doing this. And why do you want to work extra hours or take care of patients? You know, we can sit in our office. We can do this from a boat. And they didn't realize that we had such a tremendous passion and excitement for procedures and patient care. And unfortunately, a lot of radiology residents went into radiology to avoid patient interactions. And that is not the place where we want to fish from. So Andy Adams came out and his daughter lecture was one of the most, one of the more influential lectures that I heard. And it was Vinivity Vanished. And what he basically said is this, we're fishing from the wrong pond. And so this and the other things that I saw were the reason why the RFS was developed. Because basically we need a fish from surgical minded individuals. And instead of me spending all this time on Fegnomastic and Fong's disease and Olias and Mazabras and Jaffe Campanacci, I needed to spend more time on diabetes and hypertension and wound care and how stents work and how balloons work and the trials and the evidence to support it. So VR is a clinical specialty. It's vastly different from DR or pathology. And Greg Macris has a really interesting tweet showing what medical students perceive, and it's quite true. You look at radiology and pathology, very similar. Maybe we should be like surgery, GP, and cardiology. And I think that's what we need to fish from. So we have historically been recruiting from the wrong pound. This is one of my also kind of earth-breaking slides that I learned from hearing one of Barry Katzen's talk on a Jess meeting. And it was basically from Eamon Hobbs, the president of angiodynamics. We're great at innovating. We generate an idea. It's developed in our field, like genicular artery embo, prostate artery embo. And then there's a certain lifespan, and then it starts to migrate out our field, and we have residual and lost procedures. And why is that? Because we didn't own the disease. So in 2010, I went out and really fought hard to build this kind of resin fellow student section, deep oxydendra, kept lamb, assist me in the kind of initial stages of it. And now it's really a blossom thing with a really rough robust independent development with the med student council. Now, if you look at the first six letters of clinician, it's clinic. And now this was, again, a lot of these ideas are not my own. It's uh, students, residents, Karthik, my PGY6 integrated, like Dr. V, do we do enough clinic? I'm like, I don't know, I think so. But it's like, well, look at our surgical residents. Uh, they get 250 days of clinic. Our interventional cardiology res residents get a couple hundred days of total clinic during the training. We get like five. I'm like, oh, that's a good point. So what I did was we borrowed that model and we instituted a half a day of clinic a week. And that's been invaluable. And Zayim can tell you, this is about eight months in, how much he's learned from that clinical experience. So you can certainly reach out to him to showcase within eight months of having a half day of dedicated continuity clinic, how impactful that is. And think about it, he'll have a follow-up of some of his patients for five years during this training paradigm. So during your training to become a clinical interventionist, those are your first and second year. Focus on your anatomy and pathology. That's certainly important for radiology and for surgery, but you need to know pharmacology, physiology, microbiology. So study those well. Four organs you need to know really well, heart, lung, liver, kidney, okay, and the brain. 
maybe uh, the brain is five. So those are what you need to really know well, because our patients are going to have bad hearts, congestive heart failure, diastolic dysfunction, have had coronary disease, atrial fibrillation, BT, VFib, SVT, et cetera. You're going to need to understand that. COPD, DLCO, FPV1s, renal impairment, uh, hepatic dysfunction, and uh, prior strokes. You're going to need to know those. When you're an MS3, you really focus on medicine surgery, like I said, but also gynecology and neurology are important because we have a lot of overlap in those conditions. You're in fourth year, three busy IR supplies, but I don't want you in the lab all the time doing operations. You need to be in the clinic. That's where you're going to learn to be a doctor. And that, uh, one of my med students who's going to anesthesia said, you know, I figured I should go to clinic because that's where you really learn how to manage that rotation. And I think that was the uh, an invaluable pearl from her that, again, we need to spend time in the clinic and doing inpatient consults. Again, if you do that, you're going to learn the disease as well. The catheters, anyone can do. But the other side, the, the cognitive component is very hard. So the three Cs, do the vascular surgery to get the endovascular and, and kind of manage the blood vessels because that's what we're using as our highway. ICU, cardiology consults, surgical sub -I. Again, prep yourself for that surgical prelim. Again, if you look at order of importance, really clinic is where it's at, consults, then catheter time. Now, a mature clinic will have a, a consult to procedure ratio. If you're going 100% consult to procedure, that's a pre-op clinic. Someone else has made a decision what to do. Roughly, you know, you have to figure out what the percentage is, but about 50% of our consult become procedures. Because again, you're either not casting a wide enough net or someone else has made that decision for you. And then also, as you have a more mature clinic, your follow-up to initial consult ratio should be a lot of follow-ups, not a lot of initial consults. And that is a robust kind of, if you look at any other surgical discipline or clinical procedural discipline, that's what you see. Sustainability. If you are getting referrals from a specialist, you're probably not going to have a sustainable practice model. So you should get referral from primary care, urgent care, ER, podiatry, uh, family practice, IM, et cetera. That's what you should grow to have sustainability. Now, we all focus on interventional oncology at our centers, but there's only 160 transplant centers okay, in the US. There's 6,000 other hospitals. So yes, hepatobillion portal intervention is important, but that's all we, a lot of places focus on our trauma. But you need to know how to manage diabetes, hypertension, back pain, leg pain, and common diseases, fibroids, BPH, back pain, osteoporosis, stroke, DVT, PE, varicose veins, PAD. These are the things you should be learning. The other thing is to think about the service line concept, meaning don't base it on procedures. Don't base it on SFA intervention. Don't base it on ablation of a liver tumor. Base it on the disease. So these are the kind of the various service lines that we have developed and you should all look to develop to have a diverse portfolio. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't put all your money in one stock. Diversify your portfolio. So again, one year, so a vascular surgery, ICU. Some places get multiple ones of vascular surgery. That's great. Throughout the two through six, do a half a day a week of clinic. Zayim does Monday afternoon clinic with me throughout the year, no matter what rotation's on. It doesn't matter. PGY2, you need to maintain that ICU experience. Again, our patients are sick, bad heart, lung, liver, kidneys with no anesthesia support. So you need to know how to manage that. So Zayim and I did a Berta the other day and we had mass transfusion system ready. We had levofed, we had um, vaso in the room, we had the blood in the room, we had the linton tube ready to go. And that's what you need to get to. Monthly, we can be our call, covering consults and cases. Again, PGY2 is when it should start and dedicated back-to-back -back months of VIR, two months. Two months in a row is better than one month and a six-month gap in a month. PGY3 to 4, we do a five-month cognitive continuous block of CCU and in four months of VIR. Basically, by the end of that, you're basically a mini fellow. You've already got your, your technical skills up, your clinical skills are very good, and your IC skills are very high by that point. PGY5, you're continuing this, okay? You passed your boards, and now what you're doing is a little bit more ICU, a month of vascular surgery, and three months of dedicated neuro hour in a row. By the end of that block, your skill set will be invaluable. I've learned so much from my integrators who've taught me a lot of these devices, and even in the periphery, I've now been able to use that you know, from stent retrievers to obviously a lot of the kind of the neuro uh, catheters and devices. Six months of VIR stroke and peripheral call, and the final year is more of a traditional interventional, but you're still doing that half day of clinic and perhaps an ICU block. And now we're looking at away rotations where you go abroad or Zayim wants to go work with Doug Beal in Oklahoma, we're going to send them because by that point, you're more than prepared for that. Maybe you go to Europe and work with the people in the, uh, Italy, you know, like Marco Manzi and really bring that skill set or even go elsewhere and work in the lab. 
So these are some of the goals for procedures that we've advocated from cases to spine procedures to AAA repair and E-bars and TIPS. So these are some of the numbers that we prefer for interventions that I have advocated for our residents to get. And so something you should look at is the breadth of procedures, not the volume of procedures and what your autonomy is. Now, what truly leads to success? If you look at it, people always think, oh, it's the imaging. And I disagree with that in the technique. Imaging is probably the most universal thing that all throughout the world we get. Technique is becoming unfortunately more and more broad. Not everyone's doing EVARs, not everyone's doing PAD, not everyone's doing this or that. Clinical, we have a long way to go to unify that. And I will say there's a lot of disparity in our, in our, in our, not only in the US, but it'll certainly international. But ultimately, if you don't know how to build a practice, navigate the politics, the politics is actually the hardest thing for me to teach our, our graduates. But this is really what's gonna limit your ability to progress. So remember, if you look at the pyramid, really the last one is the practice of politics is probably the, arguably the most important, but you do have to be a good clinician to do the right thing. Because I can see anyone can do an opening of an SFA and convince someone that it should be done, but it may not be the right thing to do. All right, so though we're transforming this to an amazing clinical and technical specialty, we have to not forget what this is ultimately about. Why did we come into medical school? Why did we go into BIB or something else? Because it's about people, all right? Parents, grandparents, children, aunts, uncles. So you need to have a tremendous passion and you can see the people that are already speak, spoken and the people who are coming up are gonna have that. You need to have compassion and empathy for your fellow human. If you don't, this is not the field for you. Medicine's probably not the field for you. So the most important thing in medicine is this, the healer-patient relationship. It cannot be commoditized. Everything else we do can be, but this cannot. So remember these days, availability and affability. If you're not available, it doesn't matter how nice you are. And to be honest with you, what I've noticed is ability is arguably the least important. So remember, be humble and hungry. And one of the things I don't want to be known as a doctor's doctor. I want to be known as that patient's doctor or patient's physician. Another thing to remember during your training, I know it's how hard to take all these tests and go through all these hoops and hurdles, but patients fight it very hard. So we need to train and fight harder. Thank you. Hello. And this is a, a really good TED talk. I would encourage you to watch The Doctor's Touch by Abraham Burgess. All right. Thank, thank you. you so much for the talk, Dr. V. You know, there are a lot of good insights in there. I definitely, you know, manifested many of those ideas throughout my training process. And I recommend you do as well for all of you medical students out there. Um, the most important thing is to advocate for your own education. You know what's best for you as a medical student to grow and you, you have the right to advocate for it. Um, so for the next talk, I'll introduce the next moderator. Uh, it'll be Dr. Sipan Matavosian. Can you guys hear me? Yep. All right. I'm excited for this panel. Thank you for having me. Um, all right, I'm gonna uh, introduce everyone at the private practice panel now. We have four excellent speakers. First up is Dr. William Julian. He's the uh, interventional radiologist and president at South Florida Vascular Associates in Coconut Creek, Florida. He got his MD at Wash U, did his residency in Minnesota and a fellowship at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. Uh, for his first nine years of practice, he was a chief of IR in a typical hospital-based group. Then he founded um, SFVA in 2001 and was, was one of the first to break the pseudo-exclusive radiology contracts and gain independent hospital privileges. Um, in 2004, he opened his office-based interventional suite where he works almost exclusively out of now with his 34 employees. And he was a co-founder and past president of the Outpatient Endovascular and Interventional Society. Uh, then we have Dr. Mary Costantino, she's an interventional radiologist and medical director at Advanced Vascular Centers in Portland, Oregon. She got her MD at UCLA, did a residency at OHSU and um, IR fellowship at Georgetown. Um, <clears throat> she was one of the first, or she was the first in Oregon to do a transradial UFI and um, focus on uterine fibroids as well as many other procedures. And she's also an active member of the philanthropic educational organization. And then we have Dr. Robert Andrews. He's an uh, IR and medical director at Swedish Medical Center. Um, he received his MD at UCSD, 
did his fel or residency at Harbor and his fellowship at Hopkins. Um, and previously he was in academics as a clinical instructor at Hopkins and associate professor at OHSU at the University of Washington, uh, where he also served as chief of interventional radiology. And he was also a founding member of the uh, Society of Pediatric Interventional Radiology. And then last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Kavi Devulapalli. Um, he's an interventional radiologist and co-founder and CEO of Vascular Solutions of North Carolina in Cary, North Carolina, just outside of Durham. Um, this is an independent physician-owned practice. Uh, he got an MD, MPH at Case Western, did his radiology residency at UCSF and his fellowship in IR at UNC. Um, so uh, I'm gonna just ask a few questions that uh, hopefully you guys can all answer and then um, open it up to any uh, additional questions that other people may have. So the first question I have in, in whatever order you, anyone wants to answer is, uh, what's the scope of your practice? What diseases do you primarily treat? Um, and do you practice 100% IR? Maybe we can just go in order. Okay, well, hi, this is uh, Bill Julian out in Florida, and it's a pleasure to be with the esteemed panel and thank you for the invitation. So my, um, I do about 99% of my work in the office interventional suite, only go to the hospital for AAA carotid stents and the rare tips procedure. And we have a robust um, peripheral vascular practice. I'd say my bread and butter is uh, extensive artery disease in the lower extremities, a lot of pedal access, um, radial access, any and all types of iliofemoral SFA tibial work, uh, probably done about 2,000 tibial access cases in the office and much prefer to do them there than anywhere else. Uh, we do a lot of vein work, superficial vein disease, deep venous work. Uh, I've been doing more of that uh, for chronic DVT in a patient with wounds. Um, some ileal cable work, cable obstructions, do embolizations, including fibroids, varicoceles. We don't do a lot of cancer work. That was never, um, I'm a little bit older than some of the people, than pretty much everybody on the call. Maybe uh, Terry Torrance uh, is um, about my age. So, um, but there's really nothing you can't do in an office. Uh, there are people around the country who've done Y90s. We do a little bit of chemoembolization, but not a lot. And um, it, it is kind of whatever you want to make it. If, if you're good at it and you can compete and provide a good skill set and someone's figured out a clever way to make it minimally invasive, it, it really the sky's the limit. You can do pretty much everything in the office. Do you want me to talk? Thank you. Yes, Dr. Postino, please. <laughs> okay. I was, I, my, the order on the box up there may be different than the order down here. So, um, yeah, I do, I do 100% IR. <clears throat> I do, I mean, Julian has a wider scope of practice than I do, but I do um, PAD and UAE in veins. And mm -hmm. I've been an outpatient for probably about 10 years. Um, and used to take cases to the hospital, but now I have my own center. But I do um, what I want to do, and I only do IR. I kind of like diagnostic. I don't think diagnostic's terrible, but I never wanted a job. I can't sit and read. I just don't have the attention for it. Um, so your practice can be whatever you want it to be. Um, I started off when I started my practice, uh, when I built the OBL, deciding what I wanted to do. And I said no to everything I didn't want to do. Um, so I said, no, I, biopsies, I just don't want to deal with it. Um, because I had done that for eight years and I was just ready to move on to something more um, interesting. So I'm, I am really at the place where um, I can decide what I want to do and build that. I can, I do feel like now I can build any type of practice I want. I know how to build a practice. Um, but I think that's a little unreasonable to think of doing right away. I mean, I, I am, uh, I was laughing is that I'm actually a lot older. <laughs> I'm very old. I'm like 85 years old on the inside. Um, so I just feel like at this point for the next like 15 years, I, I'll do IR for the rest of my life, but I'd like to get to the point where 
um, I'm not actually working anymore and I can just, you know, go, I, my dream is just to do IR across the world charitably. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of phasing into that point in my career where I'm doing only the things I really want to do. And I can take my time. Like I want to start doing probably PAE just because I think it's really exciting, but I'm going to take my time building that up. But you have to put in the time on the front end, I'd say. I was thinking a lot about this and where, where's that sweet spot? Um, it's as, as a lab owner, I don't know that I'd want to hire somebody right out of fellowship. I think you do like another couple good years of just really rigorous, um, rigorous building of your skills. And I mean, I don't know, you never say never. And you guys are a really impressive crowd. So I would say don't have that as your goal right away. Um, because being in an OBL and being in my position can be intimidating. I mean, you're the only one. I mean, Jillian, Jillian knows this and you're practicing kind of alone. Um, so I, I do do really whatever I want and whatever's interesting, but I had to suffer a lot before I got here. <laughs> so I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's, realistic for like year one but learn 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 and like suffer and then you will have your dream career <laughs> that's great thank you that actually answers one of the other questions i was going to get to but maybe. um dr andrews just you and, and she couldn't stop talking about interventional radiology and the stuff we were doing and how she could get herself trained it was i have to say it's kind of annoying at times that, but i'm, I'm glad this did you say that about me? We missed the first part. Uh, yes, that was that was about Mary. I mean, I remember running into her in the elevators at the at OHSU, and she would ask what we were doing, what she could do, and how she could get involved. It was, uh, <laughs> it was, it was pretty funny. Yeah, Tori was at OHSU, I think, when I was a first, I did my internship somewhere else, and then I thought Tori was like, Oh my God, you're so amazing. And he, he is, he really is amazing. And I think it was like right when he was phasing out, but I was knee deep in diagnostic and I just like wanted to be in the cath lab so badly. It was why I came to OHSU and I, he was just like my hero and then he disappeared. And um, so I think it's really funny now that now full kind of circle because he was in my early IR. And I remember going to a talk with Dr. Julian at SIR when I was like a med student or resident or something. And he was talking about owning an OBL. And this was really way, way before anybody else did it. So um, these guys, I mean, the amount of work and time they've given back to our society is huge. But they were definitely big, um, big heroes of mine. We, we should clarify, too, for whatever it's worth, OHSU, I mean, we're saying OHSU, but it's actually the Daughter Institute, which is based at OHSU. So Mary also, I would point out, is, is currently on the executive committee as our representative for private practice. She's the counsel for private practice on, on DC, which is great. So um, my practice is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an accidental private practitioner. That was never my intention. Uh, I went into uh, IR. I viewed diagnostic imaging as a hurdle that I had to cross to get into IR. Um, I, it's not entirely true, but what I would say is it's almost true that I've never read an imaging study without an attending because when I finished my residency, I put imaging behind me. It's not something I'm interested in. It's not something that I have as a fallback. Um, I do 100% IR, and, and I think I'm, on the panel, I'm probably uh, unique because I'm, I think I'm the only one who's in a sort of a traditional uh, DR group. We have 200 and something radiologists in the group right now. There are 20 something people who do IR and there are only four of us who do it full time. Um, I mainly do it full time because I'm incompetent at everything else. Um, so my primary focus is liver disease. Uh, we, uh, we have a transplant center, one of the fewer, well, I mean, one of the sort of small number of private uh, hospitals with a, a liver transplant program. So my main focus is uh, tips. I got to do two of them in the last two days. Uh, we do a lot of oncology. Um, I used to do a lot of PAD. I mean, I, I kind of have done pretty much everything that's ever been part of IR, but unfortunately, you know, as IR has evolved, I've, I've lost contact with some of that stuff. So I do, the only time at this point where I'm doing PAD work is if I'm, you know, if I can't get through the iliac artery to get to the liver, you know, I don't have any problem putting a stent in, fixing it. Um, I, uh, 
you know, I, I would say that a big chunk, probably 80% of what I do now is stuff that I learned after my fellowship. I mean, I, you know, I didn't learn how to do Y90 or fibroid embolization or um, vertebroplasty or any of that stuff um, when I was a fellow because it hadn't been invented yet. Uh, and uh, so one piece of advice I would give you is learn what you need to learn now, learn as much as you can now, but don't expect that when you're finished, you're done learning because you have to, uh, you have to make a lot of effort to keep up with what's going on. And when you pick up something like PAE, you know, you're starting from scratch and, uh, and you, know, you don't necessarily have anybody who's going to show you how to do it. So um, it, it is very important, I think, if you're, if you're outside of an academic institution to identify the things that you want to get into when they're new and start doing them when they're new to everybody. Because if you decide, you know, after something is well established that you want to jump into it, you may find that the hospital is going to have some uh, privileging requirements that will keep you from being able to do it. So for instance, uterine artery embolization. I mean, you know, I was doing those within, I don't know, six months of the article that was published by Scott Goodwin because I thought it was a great thing. It was something that was going to make a big difference. But if I went in right now and tried to start without ever having done it, I don't know that my hospital would let me. I don't know if the insurance companies would let me. So keep up with what's going on, decide what you're interested in, jump on board early. And as we've said, um, you know, don't expect that these things are going to fall into your lap just because they were developed by IR. I mean, you, it, there is no guarantee that anything that you're doing now is not going to be taken away, or at least uh, that you're going to have to be. That you, there's nothing that says that you will not have to compete over that in the future. So keep up your skill set, uh, keep up uh, you know your public presence, and uh, you know stick with it. Great. Um, talk to you guys a little bit about my practice. So thanks for having me. Uh, the people on this panel are kind of my heroes. Um, wouldn't be here without them, really. So I'm Covey David Lapoli. I'm IR out here in Cary, North Carolina. My path to um, private practice um, has kind of taken a couple different routes. So like, uh, like many young grads, I started out at a traditional um, IRDR group, hospital-based private practice, and learned pretty quickly, at least in that setting for me, I wasn't able to practice the way that um, you hear many faculty on symposia such as this preaching in a clinically oriented way. So it was from that experience where I met Mary and then subsequently Bill, um, who played a really large role in teaching me more about avenues to, to practice in that fashion. And for me, in my setting, that was the OBL. And, um, you know, I think to Mary's point, I, I think it's really hard, I think almost impossible. I wouldn't say impossible, but close for many people to come right out of training and just, you know, start an OBL. Um, I think having a couple years in the hospital were helpful, but even then I'm learning something new every day. So, you know, for me, what I was really lacking was experience. And um, what I chose to do is I found a partner who was very interested in, um, in this avenue of practice. And my partner is actually an interventional cardiologist. So we joined together and uh, we created an OBL, um, one of the few in North Carolina. And uh, our primary focus is PAD, which is, which is great. That's something I never really learned in training. So we, we do the majority of our, um, of our work in PAD space. Um, I'd say my practice is somewhat unique. I'm about a third PAD, uh, third um, embolization. So I probably do more prostate artery embolization than I do UFI. That's, that's a good part of my practice. And I do about a third venous, uh, both deep and superficial venous. 100% IR in my OBL, but that's not to say I don't do any DR. Um, I actually do a fair amount of diagnostic radiology separate from my OBL as part of teleradiology. So I like keeping those skills active. Um, and more practically speaking, it's a mechanism for me to, you know, actually do things like the OBL. So taking my money that I earn as a DR and funding my IR business. That's great. Thank you all for your answers. Um, from here, I'll ask maybe a couple of you um, the next questions and if the rest uh, the other two want to answer in the chat box. Um, that would be ideal just in the interest of time. So, um, Dr. De Willapoli, my next question was basically about referral patterns. So primary care specialists, podiatrists, um, and kind of building those relationships. And I wanted to ask you and uh, Dr. Andrews, since you both kind of touched on you working with an interventional cardiologist and Dr. Andrews, who was talking about treating liver disease, but also has that uh, kind of transplant um, 
center behind them. So you, maybe you can start. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that's the hardest part, um, you know, at least for me is, you know, you're building a practice from scratch. And when you're in a large healthcare system, you know, you have the infrastructure in place and kind of the mechanism where, you know, it's perhaps maybe a little easier in some senses to get referrals. Um, kind of being on your own in OBL is a lot harder. So, you know, I think it's a lot of marketing. And I think that's one thing that, you know, I'm perhaps underappreciated, certainly had no idea about when I was a trainee. So, you know, my partner and I were, were knocking on doors, um, you know, four or five times a week. Um, internet marketing is a big, marketing is a big thing for us. Um, we have some relationships from the hospitals that, you know, we were previously at, but you'll realize pretty quickly that, you know, those relationships don't necessarily carry over once you're an independent physician. So, you know, I think the best that, you know, I can say is, you know, you, you start small, you have some good outcomes and it snowballs from there. And that's something I've noticed for myself, even for the embolizations, um, you know, marketing to primary care, um, direct to patient is very big. And you start having good outcomes, you show those outcomes and you do it again and again and again. And eventually you, you build some semblance of a practice. But it's certainly not easy and it's not for everyone. Um, you know, anybody who just wants to do cool cases and, you know, go home at 5 p.m., this is obviously not the setting for them. And I think in general, and I are, I think this is something that we need to be very um, cognizant of. I think building a practice and putting your marketing hat on is, is very important. So I would say that I, I uh, this is not something in which I am an expert, at least the, the outreach part, because uh, my practice is solely hospital-based. And so, um, I, I, you know, even though with my group, I have made efforts to try to reach out and pick up things like, uh, well, go down lane embolizations and stuff like that. But the, the fact of the matter is that most of the referrals come to us um, because they don't have any place else to send the patients. <laughs> However, I would say that uh, it, that doesn't mean that you don't take your role as the managing physician seriously. One of the things that drives me crazy is to hear people interventional radiologists refer to other doctors as clinicians. I think that is a terrible thing to do. I'm a clinician. I write notes on my patients. We have, we have uh, 10 inches of snow here today, which in Seattle is disastrous. I mean, if I have to go to the hospital, I may go on foot, but I've already rounded on all the patients. Uh, you know, I remoted in, I looked at what was going on. I called and talked to the nurses. Uh, I've written notes. You know, every time I get a call for a case, even if I don't do it, I put a note in the chart explaining why I'm not going to do it or what might be a good alternative. Um, so, you know, I mean, I have my pager with me all the time, whether I'm on call or not. The folks that I work with on a regular basis have my cell phone number and I get, I'm available and I'm responsible. And I think those are enormously important things, regardless of the type of practice that you have. I can tell you that in my practice, I do 90% of the complex biliary interventions and I do pretty much all of the TIPS procedures because I'm the only one that answers the phone. So. Um, yeah, can I I'll add on that, Tori, is that we have a hospital here that didn't do what Tori does. And even though they're in the hospital, the IR section is really deteriorated. And actually all of the hospitals just recontracted their IR with, um, actually with the daughter folks. And I think that's because they didn't have the inside the hospital what Tori's doing where he works, which it, it really, there are a very, there are a ton of similarities between private practice and hospital-based and academic. Um, I saw, I just, I'm, my brain is going crazy with all these chats because I, that's like so our area. Um, but you know, the three A's are interesting because it is true. I, I call it, I mean, I feel like I babysit people all day long, like in terms of availability. I mean, my cell phone, I get like 5,000 texts a, a month or back and forth and emails and I'm just always available to anybody. But I think you are sort of that way in the hospital too. I don't think that's just an OBL thing. Um, and then you can put in good systems to deal with that, you know, those levels of communication, but you have to always be available. But 
I always think if I'm too nice and too available, then they're going to think that I'm not actually any good at what I do. <laughs> I've struggled with that third A <laughs> quite a bit um, because I, I try to be nice to people. And, um, you know, can I mention something about the financing? Yeah, please. Yeah, because that, that was a big one. And now that I'm on the other side of it, it's actually, I get how this all is put together. And we're trying to get a meeting together through SIR called like an entrepreneurial meeting. It's just going to be a one-day webinar um, or a business meeting to talk about these things. So basically, you can almost walk into any bank right now and get money for a good price. And the more money you have, it's like buying a house. The more money you have, the better loan you're going to get. Um, and with COVID, it's really disrupted a bunch of the small business loans because that's what you really want. You really want a small business loan with a great rate, you know, and 25 to 3.5% right now. And um, you have to apply for it. Sometimes you got to put your house up. You know, all of us have built OBLs. You know, some of us have leveraged our houses, like all of our personal assets. I mean, it's a huge amount of risk. And ironically, I have like, I have one of my, my loan documents right here. And I, you look at these numbers and you're like, oh my God. Um, but so, you know, you don't, it's, it's probably not the degree of financial risk that you want to take on your first year out, especially if you have student loans. So, you know, pay off your student loans and just start accumulating as much cash as you possibly can, because then you can get better loans. You may not want to spend all your cash on that loan. Um, so let's say you have an extra, you know, $300,000 in the bank. Just having that shows the bankers that you're responsible. So the banking is a whole nother topic, but that's, that's how you do it. And the financing is the barrier of entry for a lot of people because they don't know how to find all the kind of money that you need. Um, which is why the management companies and the, you know, other kind of bigger groups will come to you and say, we'll finance this. We'll finance you if you work for us. Um, but if you want to own, own something, you just got to start saving your money. That would be my takeaway. I don't know if you guys, Julian, if you would agree with that. I mean, you've been in this game for so long. Uh, yeah, I think those are wise words. I'm, I'm actually kind of like you, uh, type, uh, listening all the stuff, the questions people are asking and trying to answer them all in our little, we could talk about this all day long. But um, if you can do it on your own, that's, that's nice. Uh, it certainly is starting out, you're not going to be able to. And, you know, I'm just going to blab out real fast here a whole bunch of things so before we run out of time that, um, like, like Mary, you've, you've got to have a good skill set you're going to deal with your complications on your own. You are basically a standalone. You're not going to be able to do that. It doesn't matter how good you are. You need to learn by lot making mistakes and learning from other people's mistakes. And so you want to make sure you, you make those mistakes in a hospital where it's more forgiving or you have a mentor like Kavi does. And um, really the key to your success is to be the best clinician in town. You're competing against the clinicians. In my, where I'm at, the IRs are out of business, the IRs in, in groups, if, because they don't, they don't have an office, they don't see patients, they're not really, they're not, you know, they're not like Tori, who's more of a clinician, and, but it's hard to do what you're doing, because you're going to be blocked getting on staff because of these pseudo-exclusive contracts, and that's one of the, one of my things I talk about, because um, in almost every hospital in the United States, you'll be, you, you'll, the radiology group will block you, even if surgeons or cardiologists are doing your procedures, now, some states like Cobbies don't require hospital privileges to work into an office suite, but in Florida, you have to have hospital privileges. And so that's a, that's a challenge. Um, you, and, and I think um, one thing I'd also do is, I, I, you may have seen how I introduce myself when I text my docs and I, get their, I try to get their cell phones so we have a contact. I call myself a vascular interventional physician. I would completely adios the word radiology from your vocabulary. Any, any relationship to imaging, it's just a tool to do, to be a good clinician, good procedures. And it's really an albatross is how I see it around your neck, that whole relationship. And it's been the biggest impediment to my career is, is diagnostic radiology and radiology groups. And you, it's possible you can thrive, but it's going to be rare. It's an uphill battle. Everyone in the group, they'll, they'll, interventional people who are successful will spend their whole career 
um, talking about all the obstacles, how, how they are a completely different physician. It's like a family practitioner and a surgeon. There's just really nothing in common. And so I think if you can somehow get out from under their wing, then that's a good way. And, and an office suite is, is one of those. So I, I know I blabbed a lot there. I'm going to stop talking, let other people continue. No, that's, that's great. Actually, that was my next question. I think we've covered several questions, but uh, we wanted to kind of get your opinion since you were one of the you know, early adopters of nixing these exclusive contracts. Maybe you can uh, kind of expand on that or anyone else that wants to talk about how those work and, um, you know, what you can do to, to kind of get away from that. Well, I know a lot about that, so I'll just talk real quick. Most hospitals have hospital-based groups like anesthesia, pathology, ER, and they basically are uh, have the contract for the concession stand, like the, like the, the beer contract in a ballpark. They, they, um, and they can come and go. The real clinicians have a private practice and those concession stands can come and go. Uh, but traditionally, since, since radiology did the IR, they have said, well, we have an exclusive contract. It's just that cardiology and surgery and nephrology and neurology, they started doing all these procedures and no one ever blocked them or, or they weren't in a political position where they could stop them. And so, so radiology became imaging exclusive and uh, and and they still do interventional but they don't have exclusivity on it they basically have exclusivity to do the crap in the hospital that nobody else wants to do because the moment some other group wants to do it they can do it but traditionally the radiology groups have been able to block irs because they'll say you're radiology and you're you're part of the exclusive and so what i'm hoping is somebody will file a big lawsuit and just eliminate these things. I've found ways to get around it. It's not easy. That's a whole talk into it itself. If you're going into a community, you might find a hospital or two that already has someone like me on staff who's broke those barriers. A lot of folks have come on my hospitals. Or you may find a hospital that's got a really crummy group. Like um, uh, Mary was saying, a lot of groups around the country are terrible and they're actually falling apart for IR. And so there's doors opening where you may be able to provide IR services and get like a, 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 con, a an agreement to cover or, or just be able to get on staff. Uh, and, and so um, I think there's more opportunities now. It's important for the youngsters to demand they get a hospital privileges and to talk to the, your, your program directors. And when you talk to administrators, you should, you should have, this is infuriating that you do not have the rights of a cardiologist and surgeon. You could have trained at the best institutions in the country and you can't compete with a cardiologist surgeon who went to the worst inst institutions in the country because you will be um, blockading on staff. And that's just not right. It's not fair. Radi the, the radiology and SIR, they have not been supportive of this. And, and the only way they will be is if there is a, um, a groundswell of young folks, bigger numbers that, that support it. So, yeah, so oh, yeah. What, what they have to hear, and I'm like, I, I, my pulse is going through the roof too of like this working with, you know, hospitals. No, I'm not working with a hospital. I blood, sweat, and tears. I mean, I do hear. So I have privileges at three hospitals and I'm friendly and I will cover call for them and, you know, whatever the groups need um, because I believe in IR. But the, the Julian has the best point is that it's in a cath lab, anybody else can go in that cath lab except for an interventional radiologist. So an exclusivity would say, nobody can do PAD in our cath lab except for the diagnostic slash IR group in the hospital. That's exclusivity. Pseudo exclusivity is cardiology, vascular surgery, they all can come in, but this IR can't. So where this hurts you is, and it's happening more and more, where you want to graduate, you go through a couple years, and you want to, you're in your town that you want to be in, and you want to start an OBL, and you can't get privileges. All they are, you just need to check the box. You're not asking to go there. You're not stealing patients. You're not, maybe you're offering to cover call, but they say no, and so you actually have to leave your city and you have to move and you can't have the practice you want to ha have. And, you know, SIR clearly says we want to support people in the practice model that they want to have. So you all who are run into this um, need to make noise about it because it's the only way there'll be shifts. 
and y'all are a lot more entrepreneurial, a lot more business savvy. These conversations were not happening for sure when I was a resident or fellow, and it's definitely not when Tori or Bill Julian were residents and fellows. And so I'm really excited for the next, you know, five to eight years um, because your career is being limited by these exclusivities, pseudo exclusivities. Now, some big groups like them because it keeps you all from invading their territory. And I think that all of us who are anti-exclusivity would say, okay, that's fine, but you have to exclude everybody. You have to, you can't just exclude IR. So that's an important piece of it is that only IR is excluded from the cath lab. I think it's important to point out, and I don't, maybe Mary mentioned this and I, I didn't hear you say it, but the, the reason that this is so important to people, to all of us, is that it has a direct impact on your ability to function no matter what your environment. So if you want to open an OBL or an ASC, typically you cannot get insurance coverage for procedures that you are going to do unless you have privileges at a hospital. And there are a couple of different reasons that are given as excuses for that, but probably the one that makes the most sense, at least to me, is that um, that way the insurance companies don't have to do any kind of accreditation on you because you're accredited by the hospital. So they've already looked into your background. They've already approved you. And so what happens is if you can't get privileges because of an ex one of these pseudo exclusive contracts, you can't practice, period. Not just not in that hospital, but not in the standalone center either. And so that's why it's such a critical problem. Um, I would also say for what it's worth, uh, we did, Mary and a, and, uh, a couple of other us, uh, put together a survey, which we managed to get distributed through the ACR or through the uh, American Board of Radiology, looking into this and getting people's opinions about it so we could better understand how to approach it. And it's been about a three-year process, but <laughs> it looks like we may actually be able to get some data published uh, from that study pretty soon. I don't know that it's going to change the situation because, as was already pointed out, the DR, our DR colleagues generally uh, like this arrangement and uh, are going to fight us on it. But, um, you know, at least we'll have a starting point for the discussion going forward. That's fantastic. That's a very interesting topic, I think. Um... Like uh, Dr. Costantino said, uh, I'm glad everybody here and uh, all of us going forward will are you know more knowledgeable about this, uh, especially um, since most practices are going to be private practice, and I think a lot of people are interested in OBLs and and uh, kind of the practice patterns that you have. Um, at this time, I think I'll open it up to. I have some more questions, but I think we we touched on almost everything at some point. So I think I'll open it up to the crowd. If Dr. V, Navji, or anybody else has any questions, um, please feel free to ask. I haven't followed the chat as much, but yeah, no, I mean I think you've addressed a lot of them. But I do, you know, you know, you know, Dr. Julian has been a huge. You know, I was lucky enough to be a fellow in ISET and hear him talk about this kind of him his practice development. I realized, man, that's kind of the way I want to practice or would be like 100% hour with a dedicated clinic. And one of the things I think is very frustrating is I talked to a lot of graduates, even Kavi and many others who can't get rights. And that's a big barrier in a competitive environment. So I think we should be able to compete at the same level with our other endovascular colleagues or whoever. And I want to know from Bill, what do you think, Dr. Julian, how do we overcome this? And then uh, Dr. Constantino is working, Constantino is working with the SIR. How do we overcome this society? How do we get our graduates, you know, that are going to be very well trained and capable to be on equal footing with their other uh, colleagues from a clinical and technical standpoint? They're fine, but not getting admitting privileges can be detrimental. You know, how do we overcome this as a group of I think best, physicians? I think the best way would be if someone could have a successful legal fight. It's just that generally these are individuals who can't aren't going to have, you know, Kavi, for instance. He he's not going to spend. Two hundred thousand dollars on legal fees to get on staff, and, and in his situation, he's able to practice in an office suite. So, if I were him, and we've talked about this, I would kind of wait for an opening at one of the hospitals, which might occur. But um, I think the young, more um, younger folks who see this as a problem, the people who went into IR residency, imagine that you go into an IR residency and you have nowhere to practice other than joining a radiology group. That's just totally wrong. A vascular surgeon would never have to do that. 
I think as they complain to to their um, faculty and and you know the, one of the problems with faculty is they're in this ivory tower and they don't actually deal with real world. They they have a different situation in the hospital, but but if the more they push it, they'll understand it. And also, I think the I, the radiology groups. They somebody uh, there was a comment about Henry saying it's good for DR and it's actually not. So here's the thing, maybe 30 years ago the exclusive was good for IR, but nowadays they they have no exclusivity. Most of the good stuff is done by other specialists, but yet the exclusivity requires them to do all the junk that nobody else wants to do in the hospital. So essentially. Even something like um, embolizations are being done by other 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 specialists. And if you it you know imagine a oncologic surgeon comes out and learns chemoembo, you think anybody's going to stop them? No. And then pretty soon, uh, most interventional stuff that was developed by IRs is going to be done by multiple other people. But they're going to keep talking about this exclusive. And all that really means is if nobody else wants to do it, you are required to do it. You're not. You're not, you should acknowledge you don't have an exclusive and just say, and get paid for it. You should tell the hospital, we don't have an exclusive. We're happy to cover it, but we need to have a stipend for this. And, and um, you know, let it, anybody who wants, if you look at um, Ter Tori's group, he's, he's, he has 287 people, but I, God knows how many hospitals. And at any one of those hospitals, if you want, which is a huge, huge, huge swath of Washington, maybe Oregon, you can't get on staff at any of those. This huge geographic area, so you're you're basically blocked out, and uh, and and yet cardiologists, and surgeons, and any other specialty are allowed to go there. So I think it's going to take either a successful um, lawsuit that gets promulgated, and you get some case law, which I don't know how that's going to happen, or you this slow attrition of more hospitals that can't find IR coverage. They're going to try to look for creative ways to get other other people there. Um, or, and you get a, a huge, a groundswell of every single resident coming out, the IR residents and, uh, comes out is complaining about it. This is not like they don't know about this. I talked about this 20 years ago. I was booted, booted, booted in Phoenix at the business meeting when I brought it up along with my friend, uh, Jerry Niedzwiecki, because, um, it, the society just wasn't ready for it. And I think now a significant portion of people are, you can't form you can't change the residence, make an IR residency and not have places for people to practice. It's like, it's kind of comical. It's very, very unfair for the society to put the young folks coming out in this position. You're like Elon Musk, Bill Julian. Like you've been saying this stuff for so long. I'm just always surprised that you keep, you keep showing up though to say it. And you've been saying this stuff. You're like so ahead of your time. You're probably building a space rocket right now. Well, Mary, that's kind of you to say. I've been cooped up here in my little COVID house, so it's like I, I, I feel like jumping up and down and screaming. I haven't done it in a while. I just don't know how you keep your calm because you have. I mean, you've called these things forever, and I mean, Tori's the same way. You guys have been saying this stuff for as long as I can remember, and it's still going on. Well, I would, can I, I just want to jump off on something that uh, – Bill said, I mean, the fact of the matter is he, he talked about um, academic practices and, and how things are being done in academic practices. And I will say, uh, having spent the first half of my career in academics, and as I said earlier, having planned to spend my, my whole career in academics, uh, I was pretty clueless about how things work in the real world. Um, you know, the way things are set up in an academic practice, yeah, you might have a clinic, but your fellows probably don't go to them. Uh, you don't have to worry about being asked to do diagnostic imaging unless you're in a really, really tiny little um, academic institution somewhere. Uh, you can pick what you want to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it is a very insular uh, environment. And it was not until I got out of that environment and went into private practice that I realized, you know, we have not been training our, our fellows uh, in a way that prepares them for the real world. And so what I would say is for those of people who are listening to this, and I, I suspect most of you are not uh, part of an academic practice, for those people, I apologize. But uh, what I would say is it's in your hands and you're going to have to fight this battle. You're going to have to help teach your, or ask the people in your, in your departments who are training you, what are you going to do to help me understand the business aspect of the practice? What are you going to do to make sure that I am prepared to do uh, everything that's asked of me. Like, 
you know, if, if you're in a typical uh, academic institution, you may not be doing biopsies as part of your IR practice because the body imaging folks are doing them. You're probably not doing any spine interventions because the neuro people are doing them. Um, and yet you get out, of the, out into the real world and nobody's going to touch a needle but you. First time I had to do a lumbar drain, some of the, the neurosurgeon came to me and said, you haven't done one, well, you're going to learn today, you know, by reading a book, I guess. So the point is, um, don't expect that what you're seeing in your training program is reflective of what's out there. I think you're getting a much better sense from this topic about what you're going to run into than what your, uh, your you know, your instructors are, are telling you because they frankly don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think the one thing that I want to add to this is something that I wish I knew earlier, and, and I made a comment on the chat, but I encourage all our trainees, is you need to understand the economic circumstances of any given situation. You need to understand how you are paid and who's incentivized. And I mean, that goes for any job you may evaluate in the future. And, you know, I think without having that framework or understanding, you know, it's really hard to kind of navigate these waters. I think that's something that I wish I would have, you know, had earlier. Um, but it's still a conversation not being had in many training programs, of course. Yeah, you know what? You could, when you get your contracts, you can probably call any one of us and we'd be willing to re to decipher the situation um, for your individual contracts and situations. I bet anybody here would be happy to to tell you what the, the real meaning behind your contract is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we are out of time. Thank you very much to the whole panel and everybody uh, for uh, asking questions as well. Um, this was a very interesting talk um, and we appreciate your time very, very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Thanks so much. I think this was uh, uh, first in uh, uh, any of these kind of interventional symposium where we heard the truth, you know, and uh, I unfortunately have talked to so many graduates that have been so frustrated and Jillian kind of brought that up. I was like, hey, where are you going to get these graduates? And so they should be able to practice anywhere with the clinic currently. Radnet and these big uh, Sheridan, they don't allow for clinic. They don't want the clinic to be built. They don't want high-end IR. So that's not fair to our patients. So we have to do something differently. And I think this, um, you're right. A lot of us didn't know that because we're in our, you know, I was in my own shell. But when I talked to the graduates and saw how frustrated and how I couldn't help them, I'm like, I, I can't allow this anymore. So I really appreciate you, Dr. Jillian and Tori and uh, Costantino and everyone kind of jumping on this and, and Covey now and kind of really pushing this forward because we do need to address this for the future of our, our patients and our specialty and our graduates. So thanks a lot. All right, I'm gonna introduce uh, Abhi Jaram, who's at UCSD, to, um, who's our next moderator, uh, who will introduce our next speaker. Hi everyone, nice to meet you all. My name is Abhi, I'm an integrated resident at UCSD. Um, and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our last speaker, um, Dr. Isabel Newton. She's an MD, PhD here at UCSD. She's in um, interventional radiologist, physician scientist at both UCSD and also the VA Medical Center here, uh, where she serves as the chief of IR and also the wellness director. Um, she has accomplishments both inside and outside the hospital. Um, her research is tr translational, that focuses on thermal, ab uh, thermal ablation uh, with liver cancer and the immune responses associated with this. But she's also the co-founder co and chair of the Interventional Initiative, which is a 501c3 organization dedicated to increasing public awareness um, with IR and minimally invasive procedures. She's also the founder and co-director and co-producer of the documentary series Without a Scalpel. So without further ado, Dr. Newton, a uh, mentor of mine, uh, feel free to share your screen and we can get started. Thank you. Um, I will share the screen now. First of all, guys, that was an incredible session. Um, one of my pet peeves is that we are so myopically focused on um, academic medicine, even though I'm myself, I'm very academic. And so I think we can do more in our societies and in our meetings like this to engage um, our private practice colleagues, because face it, many of the innovations, in fact, the majority of the innovations in IR at the very beginning and throughout have been through private practice. And so this voice is an incredible one to hear. And I applaud you guys for having the, um, the vision to do so. So Avi, thank you very much for um, inviting me and also for um, helping me with these slides. Um, so if they look slick, it's not me. So um, 
the first question is why do you want to do research and this seems a little bit um sort of um i don't know fundamental but a lot of people uh, want to do research because they think it looks good and um, they're trying to flush out their um, resume and and that might be a good reason to do small projects um things that can be accomplished in a relatively short period of time but really anything you do to check a box is going to um, sort of come across as box checking uh, to your mentors and also to those who interview you later on. And so I encourage you when you decide that you want to do research to really ask yourself what is your motivation and make sure that it's something that fulfills you and that is um, is helping you work towards your long term goals. So I always encourage my mentees to. Uh, work on something called an individualized development plan and to fit all of their goals within kind of a five and 10 year plan. So if research fits into that, great, but it doesn't have to. And you know, you can have a very rich resume that does not include research. And so that's sort of the beginning message. Um, if you do want to do research, you don't only have to do clinical, you know, there's um, translational research, like the research that I do, um, there's basic research, um, like some of my um, T32 IR residents um, do, you can look at um, epidemiology, uh, you can look at economics or you know procedural or policy research you can look at diversity research um, there's all different types of questions that you can ask and so don't be so myopic um, you know there's ethics research um, that that I'm working on with Eric Keller um, you know ha expand your mind and really go after things that get you excited because the most important fuel to um, pursuing research which is something that can sometimes be um, stagnate for a while or, or be frustrating is that make sure it's something that you are uh, feel passionate about and want to understand and how it's kind of interweaves with um, your career pursuits. And you guys, Abby will help me manage the chat because I can't see it. And so you guys can butt in anytime you want to. The next question is who can help you? Um, and you know, everybody talks about mentors and mentors are extremely important, um, but you know, it's not just one mentor and it's not just mentors, they're also mentees who can help you and um, colleagues, peers. So look at sort of the gamut and um, you can develop a group of people who, um, when you have everyone working together towards your research goals, which are common, it becomes less of this kind of slog or a solitary pursuit and more of a really vibrant collaborative interaction. And that's actually what drives most of my research pursuits. Um, the research questions are less important to me than who I share them with. And um, I, I cannot stress that enough. So I have mentors um, who serve also as mentors to my mentees. So my lab um, is within the lab of Nick Webster. Um, he's a PhD who studies um, HCC hepatocarcinogenesis, um, but he also serves as a mentor to my mentees, Tyler Mant and uh, Mansoor Ghani, and um, my two other men, um, uh, mentees who are graduate students. And so you can um, you know, choose different people. I have a collaborator, uh, a collaborator um, Nicole Steinmetz, who's a, a genius um, nano engineer, who's also the mentor to Christine Boone, but she so serves sort of as a mentor to me in grant writing and in navigating kind of the, the crazy NIH system. Um, and then I have many others. And the thing is, is they each add a piece. And then um, when I have my interactions with them, I in turn, um, you know, add to their research pursuits. So it's a give and take. But the reason why I want you to kind of consider um, mentees uh, in terms of who can help you is, you know, in the example of Eric Keller, who's an incredibly um, motivated and uh, imaginative um, uh, resident at Stanford, he had so many projects that we sat down, we said, these are way too many projects for you to pursue by yourself, but you are already thinking at the level of, um, of sort of a junior PI. And so we kind of divvy these projects up and describe them. And he was able to enlist medical students, incredible medical students. Some of them um, like Helena Rockwell are you know, in, in the planning committee for this great uh, meeting that you guys have. And they're doing just, in, you know, amazing high level research together. And they have, you know, uh, I, I'm one of the the um, the mentors sort of um, overseeing and there are others, Nishida Kothri as well. Um, and in that system, you know, everybody's kind of uh, lending their talents to 
towards a common goal. Uh, when you choose a mentor, you want to choose someone who, who is generous um, with their time and their support of you. You want someone who will put you in places where you can succeed, but also is willing to be available to help you through this research. Uh, you may be someone who needs a more hands-on person or a less hands-on person, depending on your skill set, and make sure that you're clear about that um, from the outset. And as a mentee, you really need to be the one kind of um, pushing to meet and to have those uh, that follow-up because many times you end up chasing around your mentor um, to some degree or other, but you don't want to be dragged through this. You wanna be the initiator and that initiation, if you can do it in a way that um, balances, you know, being present and not being kind of um, overly um, insistent um, can be an incredibly productive relationship. Um, and then what does success look like for you. Um, this is an important thing to consider that almost nobody thinks about when they get started. They're like, you know, I just want to do some research. It'd be great if I do this or that. Um, is success measured in um, what you learn? As it was for me when I was a research resident at UCSD, you know, I um, joined a lab that was completely different from my PhD. I knew that it was going to be a while before I got papers out, but I needed to learn um, some critical skills because I understood that I wanted to work on this precision medicine question, and some manifestation. So success for me was um, learning an entirely new field of medicine um, or, or of science, um, learning the opportunities and limitations of imaging science, um, and then papers would be great, but they were not the, the principal measure of success. For other people, having papers, patents, um, grants, those are a measure of success. For other people, it's networking. You know, how many you know, people can you um, build relationships with so that when you become an independent um, researcher or go to the next level, you have people that can become part of your community. Define this ahead of time, but don't be afraid of this measure of success evolves as you do. Um, and that goes back to the individualized development plan um, kind of uh, model for how to envision your future. And if you're interested in that, you can just Google it. Um, it's a, a common tool that's used across the U.S. and has been proven to Im um, improve your uh, goal attainment across time. Uh, how do you balance research as a busy resident? Um, this is a really difficult question. So for those of you who are medical students, if you have a, a hard time kind of balancing, you might look for a program that offers dedicated research time, like UCSD, like Penn. Um, you know, there are others as well. And if you, um, if you can, if you're good at balancing or you're um, wanting to do, you know, projects that... Um, can be done sort of on weekends and evenings, then that's kind of how we do it. Um, some programs offer dedicated research time, like UCSD does offer um, a month of research to the non-research residents. So these are important questions to ask ahead of time. But as with anything, um, balancing is about um, making sure that you go in with eyes wide open about what you're willing to give and setting limits um, for your time. Because as we all know, family is important. Uh, personal health is important, um, and your pursuits are important. So um, have a, a, a reasonable um, understanding of what things are going to take. And that's that comes from good communication with a good mentor. And then um, what does life as an IR attending in academics look like? Um, it is extre extremely varied. Uh, for me, I have um, had as much as half a day of research um, that was protected, and then that went away. Um, and I use that at the beginning to build up my lab. Now, now my lab is pretty self-sufficient. Um, I will be getting another half day back, um, but I work at the VA. And so, you know, and it's by no accident, their inefficiencies are my opportunities. So sometimes I am working on papers or grants or data in between things. Sometimes I'm using my academic day. Um, sometimes I do it on the weekends, sometimes in the evenings, but I, I have three kids. Um, I have a husband and I, um, and I love my clinical duties as well. So, you know, in some way you can have it all, but you just have to define what does all look like. And are you going to be, you know, as excellent in all aspects as others? You know, sometimes I'm doing great in, in um, research and sometimes my mentees are really just um, trying to pin me down. And they, um, they understand that this is part of the deal. I, I say it very clearly at the beginning. Um, but, you know, if, if that's not a style, a, a mentorship style that they, that they appreciate, then 
uh, we can find co-mentors to help supplement or they can go to a different lab. Um, but this is kind of what that looks like. And, and to be unapologetic about it, um, try your hardest, but be unapologetic is how I sort of balance things. So I, um, I'm going to um, look at the chat now and ask Abby to help me. Um, yeah, Dr. Newton. So there's quite a few questions okay. that I, I, can, I can let you know about. So the first question is, uh, there's many um, international medical students mm -hmm. um, that might be struggling to find mentors and avenues to get into research that might be in the United States. Uh, what advice or channels could these uh, students go through? Yeah, so um, there are different channels and it depends, like if you are a medical student at um, in Europe, for example, in some places, you might um, have also pursued a graduate degree. So you could come as a postdoctoral um, fellow to a lab. It depends on the type of research you wanna do. So if you come as a postdoc, um, you could work for several years as a postdoc in a lab if you have those kinds of skills. Um, and then you could get paid for that, obviously. Um, if you're looking at like, you know, UCSD's T32 research residency program, which is NIH funded, it funds a year of research at the outset and then six weeks each year subsequently, that's available only to um, individuals with, uh, who are US citizens or have a green card status. And that's not something we control, that's mandated by the NIH. Uh, there are other opportunities. There are opportunities at the NIH. Um, they accept fellows and um, do high quality research. Bradwood is amazing. Um, and we have residents who have come from uh, his lab and are doing really well at UCSD. Um, if you're trying to do um, more uh, clinical kinds of things, you could come and do a visiting um, uh, student um, position. We had Mache um, from Poland come and work with us and he did research with us and also observed um, you know, procedures, but that requires being able to fund yourself or getting funding from your, your um, country or your institution. So it's a little bit more difficult um, to do those things, but uh, I think that networking and reaching out to IRs who are like-minded or have um, research interests that you're interested in is a good start. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for that thorough answer. Um, another question that came up was um, this idea of mentorship um, is certainly very prevalent in IR programs throughout the country. What would you say the role of a mentee is in that relationship? Mm -hmm. We often just look at the mentor, you know, but what's the role of the mentee? Is That's this, a great you know, question. Bi-directional relationship. Yeah. And, in, and some institutions are offering training in mentorship and in being a mentee. And if you have that opportunity, I would definitely take it. I've taken a mentorship course. Um, in order to be a good mentee, uh, you have to be good at um, communicating and good at following through. So many times you'll have a meeting, this happens many times, where I'll meet with a mentee and we come up with things that we're going to do. And then I never really hear back again, or I hear back and we have another meeting and they haven't followed up on what we talked about before. And maybe the meeting has to be initiated by me. Um, and so then I start to feel guilty because time has passed. It really requires initiative. And so the best mentees I've ever had are ones who um, are respectful, but still, you know, sort of persistent and diligent. Um, and don't be afraid to just sort of cold call someone. You know, some of my very favorite mentees are ones that just kind of reached out like, Helena uh, Rockwell, she just, she came as a first year medical student said, I want to do IR, you know, can I, can I work with you? And I'm like, who is this amazing person? And then the more I work with her, it's just been so rewarding. Um, and I have mentees also even outside of IR who are like that, but same thing with, you know, um, uh, you know, Mansoor is an unbelievably um, attentive mentee. He started even while he was still at, at Yale reaching out and we were working together. So that kind of um, ability to um, follow through and be persistent and ask questions uh, is one that, that leads to a very good relationship. Awesome Tyler is the same way too. Tyler Bant, I shouldn't forget Tyler, I love him. Yeah, Tyler, Christine, <laughs> Mansoor. Christine, unbelievable. Yeah. Um, another question, uh, just uh, a lot of residents seem to be having questions about just um, how to design the study on their own and kind of resources um, right. to kind of create appropriate research questions, et cetera. 
That's a what really advice? good question. Um, and I don't think you should have to design it on your own. Um, you know, you really should, part of the mentor mentee process is, you know, you can come in with an interest and your mentor should really help you with that, unless it's a very simple project. Um, your mentor should really help you with the design aspect of it. So you can come and I, I encourage you to take a stab at it and say, you know, this is what I'd like to do. This is kind of the design I'm thinking about. In fact, that, that shows a lot of um, growth. But um, the role of the mentor is to help you refine that and make sure that it's going to be successful. Um, and that's why, you know, if your mentor is not able to do that, that doesn't mean they're a bad mentor. It means that maybe they're good for a different aspect of your career. Um, but maybe you could say, you know, can we bring in somebody else that could help with the design? Or I, I need a little help with the design. Can you suggest someone or can you yourself help me? Uh, that's a difficult process that even, you know, we go through whole PhDs to learn how to do that kind of stuff. And it doesn't mean that you can't do it without a PhD. I mean, you know, Tyler doesn't have a PhD or a master's and he's fantastic at designing, um, you know, experiments, but it's something that takes time. Great. And I think we have time for just one more question. I think uh, just, you know, interventional radiology is such an innovative field and we're constantly creating new um clinical and procedural innovations that, you know, we see published. Um, what do you think we need to do as a field long term to kind of make these new innovative procedures more of a reality in, 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 in their safety, efficacy and durability long term? There's a that, that's a lot. Um, you know, research is obviously important, but messaging is important. And, you know, and you heard in the last session, um, we have to fight for our real estate as IRs. Um, and that means um, leveraging our voices and leveraging the power of what we do. Um, we are not surgeons. And so, you know, our value add is the fact that we can go in there and do something absolutely extraordinary and change people's anatomy through a pinhole. People can go home the same day or the next day and they have a Band-Aid. And so being able to communicate that message, which is why I spend a lot of time thinking about things through the interventional initiative and without a scalpel, is one of the ways to be able to um, pave the way towards, um, you know, advancing some of the, the procedures that we do. Our procedures change so quickly and our, the methods are so varied that a, you know, randomized control trial is not likely to be the proper format for vetting most of them. Um, there are some that will be good, but we have registries that we can, um, we can uh, build and we can partner with, uh, industry to help us leverage, um, you know, the testing of our ideas and sometimes even partner with industry and pharma to get more money to do um, trials that demonstrate efficacy of what we do in combination with other therapies. I think that's going to be where we have um, the most success. Awesome. Well, thank you um, so much for taking time out of your Sunday and, and yesterday too. Dr. Newton spoke uh, with us yeah. yesterday as well and the woman and I are panel. So she's been really invested in this uh, symposium. So thank you for your time. And um, with that, I'll turn it back to Navjeet um, to you. conclude this symp symposium. All right. Hey, how's it going? Thank you very, you know, uh, hold on one second. Let me, let me put this up. So we actually have a, a post survey. Um, you know, if you have, uh, if you, it's a little QR code. If you haven't had the chance to uh, fill out that survey yet, please do just to snap a picture of it. And there's just a couple of questions that will really help us out and, you know, make this event uh, really successful, successful next year as well. You know, I really want to thank all of the panelists, all of the organizers, and all of you, the attendees, uh, for taking the time out of your Sunday to join us. Incredibly valuable panels and presentations today. And, um, you know, thank you for making the first annual West Coast Vascular and Interventional Symposium a great success. And again, thank you, Dr. V. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do this without your help. Um, so hopefully uh, you guys have a great rest of your Sunday. Um, and again, we may be in the chat for just a, a couple more minutes. So feel free to let us know if you have any questions, ask them. And, um, you know, I'll type in my email in, in there as well and my Twitter. Uh, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, and we're happy to help find, uh, help you find resources or, or answer any questions that you may have. Yeah. I mean, thank you. Um, I want to say uh, thanks to Navjeet as well. Uh, you know, I've been dreaming about kind of doing a, a symposia on the West coast for some time, but 
never had the wherewithal or bandwidth or capacity or capability to do it. But Nebji's like, hey, Dr. Wee, what do you think about it? Oh, I'm like, absolutely. And this guy, um, along with so many countless students and residents here and around the country and even internationally made it happen. So kudos to you and very unique format, especially this private practice panel, which I think is very timely because I think we need to address some of these issues. And uh, Dr. Newton's research, we have to embrace the research. In order for us to, we can't just innovate, we need to validate. So we need to do both. So I think it's, it's all timely as we are a new specialty. And these next 10, 15 years will, will be the defining moment for our specialty. And you in the crowd, the residents and students are what's gonna define it. So this is why this meetings exists. Thanks everyone for joining.